Okay. Let's go ahead and get started with our 3.30 session for this afternoon. I'm Linda Hartel. I'm one of the planning committee members Need to get this recording going here. Sure, we're set. Okay, it looks like we're set for recording. So um, I'm happy to introduce um, Professor Margaret Mudge. Dr. Mudge is a um, clinical professor here at the OSU College of Veterinary Medicine, and she is the section head for equine services. She conducts research in a variety of areas related to um, horse health, particularly in the issue areas of emergency surgery and critical care. So we're really happy to have her this afternoon um, sharing information with us about clinical trials for horses with gastrointestinal disorders. So Dr. Mudge, really happy to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, thank you to Danny Dotson for in inviting me. I'm not sure that I quite knew what I was getting into, but uh, Jessica Page, our librarian in vet med, assured me that science librarians are interested in just about everything. And so I really hope that horses fit into that. Absolutely. All right, well, I will share my screen here. All right, hopefully everyone can see this PowerPoint slide. Looks great. Great. All right. Um, well, I, you know, I, I thought that I'd talk a bit about clinical trials for horses with gastrointestinal disorders. I have no idea if there are any horse people in the audience. And I realized with a little bit of a panic this weekend that uh, as I was thinking about the talk, and I thought I, it's hard to read the room on Zoom. So uh, I will assume that there are probably some of you who know something about horses and probably some of you who know absolutely nothing about horses or have no experience with them. Uh, so I'll start with just a little bit of my background to give you perspective on you know, where, where, I, where I'm coming from and also in, in thinking about what role libraries and librarians play in what we do. Uh, you know, I'm, I realize that I'm at a you know, Science for Librarians conference, but I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a researcher, even though I do research. Uh, so I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, about 10 minutes from Pimlico Racetrack, and I fell in love with, with horses and horse racing and uh, everything that horses can do as athletes. And so while I had known for actually longer than I loved horses that I wanted to be a vet, uh, I kind of switched from, you know, dogs and cats over to, to horses after getting that experience. Uh, I went to vet school at University of Pennsylvania and then went on to do an internship in private practice at Rudin Riddle in Lexington, which is one of the biggest equine practices in the US. Uh, I then went to UC Davis for a residency in equine surgery and then ended up coming to Ohio State, uh, gosh, about 17 years ago to do a fellowship in emergency and critical care because you know, part of what I really love, this is, this is our ICU. So uh, when this is full of horses, we are, we are extremely busy. And then uh, you know, I hope I don't make anyone you know, grossed out by surgery photos. There aren't too many in this, uh, but this is me also doing what I love, which is uh, you know, fixing horses intestines. So this is a horse that had strangulated small intestine and uh, sort of kind of sorting it all out and the purple stuff is gonna to have to get removed. Um, and horses have 60 to 70 feet of small intestine. And so there is lots of potential for things to get tangled up and cause problems, which keeps me in business. In terms of you know, kind of what I, what I do, and, and there's all variety of clinical appointments within vet med. Uh, and so I am, a 75% clinical appointment. So you know, somewhere around 75% of my time, I am in the clinic seeing cases, working up horses uh, and doing surgery. And while I'm doing all of that, that's with fourth year veterinary students and residents and sometimes interns. Uh, and then the remainder of my time, uh, I occasionally go on vacation and then the bulk of, of the rest of that time is uh, preparing lectures for didactic teaching of both veterinary students and graduate resident students, 
Uh, and my, you know, my research appointment is less than 5% of, of you know, my FTE. Uh, and so I'd say you know, probably more of what we're doing is, is trying to stay on top of the current literature for our residents and students, uh, you know, making sure that we're practicing the most up-to-date evidence-based medicine, uh, but then occasionally uh, kind of sparking some idea of, of you know, can we can we further clinical practice, and uh, you know, can we perhaps publish that? Um, and so, yeah, this is this is our our equine center in in winter. Um, so the Galbraith Equine Center that was built in '96, so a relatively newer part of the hospital, even though that seems like a long time ago now. Uh, this is a horse that's on intravenous fluids in our ICU, and so uh, if anyone is familiar with human realm of medicine, these are five liter bags of fluids. So this horse has 20 liters at a time that are able to, to flow into it intravenously. So uh, yeah, this factors in a, with, uh, with cost for clients, certainly. Uh, we are quite close to Sciota Downs, which, uh, and we see a lot of standard bred race horses uh, and, and breeding work. Uh, and then this is one of our, our classes of veterinary students. So to, Kind of sidetrack a little bit into the you know, the research realm of things. Uh, I work with a with a team. Um, this is, is, is certainly not the only people on on the team, but I the there is a an equine faculty of ten to twelve faculty members, and there are three of us who are assigned to the emergency and critical care service. Um, but we work closely with anesthesia. We also work with our small animal emergency and critical care colleagues, and so some of the research that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, involves, uh, you know, involves all, the, all of these people as well as uh, we, we currently have two fellows in emergency and critical care who are actually housed at other universities but are spending a portion of their time with us, uh, mainly doing clinical work but also involved in some research. So I wanted to highlight, uh, we'll go through three different clinical trials that we have and this is just kind of my thought process on how how we got into those or, or uh, you know, kind of how we frame this. The first of which is, you know, what is the problem? So, uh, you know, and I'm focusing on gastrointestinal, which is a big problem in horses. Uh, and then into what do we already know? Uh, so a lot of the, the literature review and um, trying to determine if someone has already come up with a solution. Uh, a bit of what can we steal or maybe borrow from our human counterparts. So, uh, you know, there's so much higher volume of, uh, of patients seen on the human side. And there's, that doesn't always translate completely to horses, but there's a lot that we can learn from human medicine uh, and, and hopefully vice versa as well. Uh, and then how can we collaborate with other universities to increase our case numbers when it comes to clinical trials and, uh, and how can we get funding through grants? So a little background for those of you who aren't horse people. Uh, if, if you have horses, you probably know what colic is. Uh, if you don't have horses, uh, colic equals gastrointestinal pain. Um, and that's a non-specific term. It doesn't always you know, tell you precisely what the, the lesion is, but essentially horses that are acting like they've got a pain in their, in their belly. And colic is the leading cause of death in horses one to 20 years of age. And the you know, American Horse Council has, has followed a, a lot of the reports on horses and causes of, of death, uh, as well as you know, just morbidity. And there are estimated to be 4.5 events per 100 horses per year. So this is a, a fairly common condition. Um, the last estimate that I could find was from a 1998 study as far as cost, and they'd estimated $115 million in cost of colic, uh, and that would be to the owners of these horses. So as far as you know, what is colic, uh, I'll show a video of this horse that's in our, in our ICU uh, and is showing signs of abdominal pain. This is not the only way horses show pain, but this is pretty typical, if not the most dramatic, but this is a, you know, a horse that's that was down doing a little bit of rolling. He gets up, he's still not comfortable. And so now he's circling, circling, and you know, we'll kind of crouch uh, and then go back down again, uh, roll up onto his back. And we think they're trying to take some pressure off of, you know, off of their belly essentially when they're, when they're doing this. And we often can treat this medically, but there are, you know, there are times that we have to end up treating them surgically. 
In terms of our, so I, you know, just as a rough estimate, we see approximately 150 colic cases per year in our, in our equine center at, at Ohio State with about 75 colic surgeries per year. That's certainly not reflective of, you know, of, of the horses that are out in the world that, you know, that have signs of colic on the farm. Uh, it's nowhere near 50% that need surgery. We're dealing with a referral population, so certainly a higher percentage of, of colics. And just to take you through a little bit of what's involved in doing colic surgery, um, we, we've, we have this horse who's you know, behind kind of a, a squeeze door here and getting an intravenous bolus of, of anesthetic through this, this IV catheter. Uh, once the horse is down from a combination usually of some, some xylazine, ketamine, and midazolam, uh, this, this horse is then, hobbles are put on and we're hoisting these, these horses onto the table. Uh, in general, horses weigh about 1,200 pounds would be average. I did uh, colic surgery on a horse over the weekend that was closer to 2,000 pounds, a big Belgian draft horse. Uh, and so we need, we need some mechanical help getting them onto the table. So the horse is you know, lifted up and then uh, put down onto, onto a table to get wheeled into surgery, and then they're put onto inhalant gas anesthesia. Um, so overall, the process of anesthesia and surgery is actually not all that dissimilar to what you would see in, in people or small animals, but the, the size of the horse definitely presents a challenge. Um, and then once we're in surgery, we're typically approaching a, a colic through what we call a ventral midline incision, so on the underside of the, of the belly uh, to access the abdomen. And you know, what are we finding in here? A lot of things that can get twisted up. So I'd already mentioned they have a whole lot of small intestine that, that can get trapped. This is a horse that had a, a fatty tumor, and this is the band of that tumor that is uh, it's a benign tumor technically, but um, becomes, becomes problematic when it wraps around the intestine and then cuts off the blood supply to this, to this segment on the right. Uh, this is the horse's large colon, so horses are hindgut fermenters, and that's how they get their nutrients from all the forage that they're grazing all day, and as the gas goes through, usually no problems, and every once in a while, the gas will kind of act like a balloon, and the colon will twist on itself. Uh, these are not the only types of surgical emergencies, but these are some of the most urgent uh, surgical emergencies that, that we see are horses with what we would call intestinal strangulation. Uh, and that's actually part of the reason that when I did a surgery residency, I carried on to do an emergency and critical care fellowship uh, because a lot of what we see day and night, but certainly middle of the night and on the weekends, uh, we, we can't wait for hours on, on an intestinal strangulation. This is something where when it arrives, once we've got it diagnosed, these horses will go to surgery immediately. So not that long before I started into vet school, there have been some publications on survival from small intestinal resection that was at a, a somewhat dismal 24% um, survival. And over the last 15 years, most of the publications report somewhere from 75 to 84% uh, survival from small intestinal resection. Uh, and you know, a lot of those in general for overall, not just small intestinal resection, but for colic surgery, you know, most of the veterinary retrospective studies report colic survival rates greater than 85%. Um, so, so not, you know, not perfect by any means, but, uh, but, but certainly improve. Uh, and while you know, I'm sure that veterinarians in referral hospitals would like to take some credit for this. Most of this has to do with early referral. Um, and so veterinarians in the field getting them educated about early recognition of colic and early referral for, for surgery. Uh, just to get, give you an idea of some of the things that are useful to us in thinking about, all right, where can we make improvements? Uh, well, with the overall colic prognosis, and this is from two you know, paired studies by Chris Proudman in 2005 uh, from the UK. These are looking at horses that were discharged from the hospital, um, so they were recovered from anesthesia, and, and of, their, of their colic population, 75 to 85% of them were discharged, with the majority of those discharged returning to athletic activity. Uh, the, these survival curves that you're seeing here, this is large intestinal surgery, so appears without resection, so you know, getting pretty far out in survival time, we're still seeing you know, close to 80%. These are horses that, that did have intestinal resection, uh, and so a pretty dramatic difference in survival between resection and no resection. 
this is small intestinal surgery. So you can see that these, these approach each other a little bit closer, perhaps because these are older horses. Uh, but we've got, uh, I apologize, I thought my phone was turned off. Uh, so we've got survival time that, uh, that is far, far greater for horses that don't have intestinal resection. So as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at a lot of you know, retrospectives as well as kind of analyzing what, what we do as a group to, to decide you know, where, where do we fall short? So you know, of either, either with this 85%, how could we do even better? Or in the subset of cases, uh, you know, where might we be able to make improvements? So post-operative ileus is one of our, one of our biggest challenges, uh, in, particularly in horses with small intestinal resection. Um, surgery site infections and uh, some of the complications we see with antibiotics are, are another risk. Uh, and then in general, these horses that are coming into us sick with poor perfusion, um, you know, they can often be septic. We can see multi-organ dysfunction. Um, and then this is just an, an interesting example of you know, they, if a horse gets an infected incision, uh, one of the risks is hernia formation. And this is uh, a, a a borrowed image there of one of the more dramatic hernias that I've seen. And all of this adds up to money uh, and usually money for the client. So there is insurance for, for animals, for horses, uh, but I would say the majority of our clients do not have insurance on their horses. And there's a limit to how much insurance will cover. A, a typical insurance policy for a, for a horse may cover up to ten thousand uh, dollars, which will certainly cover the average colic surgery, uh, but the horses are usually dropped from coverage after that that one episode of colic. And so, if there are further episodes of, of colic or requirements for more surgery, that often is not covered by insurance. And there are more severe cases that can certainly go over ten thousand dollars. So, we as a group we're looking at you know, how can we improve outcomes for surgical colic? I already mentioned that early recognition and referral from our referring vets is, is by far the most important, particularly for suspected strangulation. And this is not a complete list, but you know, based on some of the clinical trials that we're doing, we're looking at, you know, can we improve some of the monitoring and targeted resuscitation that we're doing under anesthesia to per perhaps prevent some of that end organ dysfunction that we see? Uh, could we get better at, with our antimicrobial prophylaxis, both preventing surgical site infection, but also hopefully preventing antimicrobial resistance, which is important not just for our horses, but for all of us. Uh, and then specifically looking at post-operative ileus, uh, I'll talk a little bit about a clinical trial with acupuncture that we, that we have ongoing. Uh, all these trials are ongoing, and so uh, I guess spoiler alert, I'm not going to give you much in the way of the results, but more of the process of you know, how we work through, through these ideas. So in terms of resuscitation, uh, you know, part of the problem is that poor perfusion can lead to colic pain, post-op ileus, uh, what we call endotoxemia, which is essentially sepsis, but horses are very, very susceptible to any of the toxins that can leak through their intestine. Uh, and they are also prone as, as are humans and small animals to acute kidney injury. We typically under anesthesia are looking at what we would call macrovascular perfusion parameters. And so that would include heart rate, blood pressure, and, and sometimes cardiac output. I, I put that there, although typically heart rate and blood pressure for sure, cardiac output would be more of a specialized measurement and depending on how you're measuring it, pretty expensive to measure. Uh, Looking at the microvasculature, a good marker can be lactate, but that's not directly looking at it. The horse's mucous membrane or gum color can actually be a, a quite a cheap and useful marker, although, although not uh, you know, you know, the most sensitive or direct measurement. Uh, and then we actually can directly measure microcirculation. And so I'll, I'll show you some images of, of that. So we looked a bit at you know, what do we already know about resuscitation, particularly IV fluids under anesthesia. And there's a you know for for vet med and horse horse veterinary medicine, there is a decent amount of information about uh, about how horses do under anesthesia and what types of fluids might might be the most useful. And a lot of that is focused on what we would call the macro circulation. So what does this do to heart rate? What does this do to blood pressure and cardiac output? 
uh, and we have we have largely focused in the horse on thinking about more is better. You have more fluids to resuscitate the horse. Uh, but we also know in looking at, uh, at human studies that more is not always better. And so on, on the left, we have a study that is looking at patients after, after intestinal surgery and looking at a comparison of two, two different perioperative regimes. Uh, and the, the people that were in the more restrictive regime had fewer complications than, than the patients that were, on, uh, that, that were on this higher amount of saline regime. So oral fluids versus, versus uh, getting saline. Uh, with these saline groups having higher body weights, meaning that they were retaining some of, the, some of this fluid, uh, which was leading to complications. Um, another you know, fairly interesting study uh, that, was, that was done on, this was looking at mortality after fluid bolus in children in Africa with severe infection, where IV fluids were not always practical. And you know, Looking at looking at mortality, this curve on the on the bottom, so the lower mortality, was getting no fluid boluses at all. Um, so the expectation was that uh, you know albumin would probably be the best and it's the most expensive and would be thought of as the standard of care. And saline might be a close second, uh, but you know, certainly we need to give these these patients fluids. Uh, and they actually found that in these these children, many of whom had severe diarrhea and infections, uh, that that no IV bolus and trying to manage with more conservative enteral fluids was actually more helpful. These aren't necessarily direct correlations to what's happening under anesthesia in our horses, but was a bit of food for thought on more is not always better. And we sometimes can cause problems with our IV fluids uh, in creating, creating tissue edema and potentially uh, you know, causing fluid overload in our patients. And so, one thing that we were, that we were interested to look at in, in our horses uh, was what's called microscan. So this is a handheld video microscope and the technology is side stream dark field microscopy. And so this is you know, essentially a small microscope that is put on the inner, inner gum or lip of the horse. Um, so completely non-invasive. And you're actually seeing small capillaries and the, you know, this motion that you're seeing go through them uh, that is the, the individual red blood cells moving through these capillary beds. Uh, and so we can look at what is the movement of blood, uh, you know, how, it, how normal is the flow and what's the density of, of the vessels, how many of them, you know, how many of them are there, how well, well are they perfused and what does the flow look like. And we know from human clinical trials that there is an association between vascular density and mortality in septic populations. Uh, and that there's a discordance, so a discrepancy between what's happening at this capillary microcirculation level and the mean arterial pressure. Uh, we had also used microscan in the horse with our group looking specifically on the colon. That's not always uh, as, as practical in, in some of our you know, clinical surgical cases. Uh, and then some other groups had, had reported on using the oral mucosa in healthy horses. Uh, and so we had aimed to look at, at intraoperative, both macro and microvascular perfusion. So uh, you bring up these, these images while the horse is under anesthesia uh, and using this uh, you essentially micro scan microscope on their, uh, on their oral mucosa um, and, and trying to see whether there was a correlation between things like cardiac output and blood pressure and, and this microcirculation. And ultimately, we would love to see if there's higher rates of post-op complication, including multi-organ dysfunction. Uh, we need much larger numbers for that, but our initial pilot study was really just meant to see, can we do this without being disruptive in surgery and, you know, and, and get clinically useful data? Uh, and so essentially, these were horses that were, that were enrolled as we we're going to surgery on emergency, uh, and they were getting three, measurements at three different time points under anesthesia with lithium dilution cardiac output, and then also looking at microscan as well as the, the typical blood pressure and, and heart rate measurements along with blood gases. Um, and just as a clinical case example, so this is a horse that in the first part of anesthesia, relatively steady with a, a 
an acceptable but not high mean arterial blood pressure. Uh, and cardiac, so the blood, and then you can see that between 90 and 150 minutes, with our typical measurement of blood pressure, we think that we're we're doing good work. We're making improvements in this in this mean arterial pressure. We've got it just over 80, which is about where we want it. Uh, we also measured cardiac output and saw that 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 was at least holding steady, but not making as much improvement as the mean arterial pressure. And then this perfused vessel density, so looking at the micro scan, uh, we were actually seeing some decline in that. So meaning, and this was not consistent across all, all horses, but, and some of them went in the opposite direction where the blood pressure, it seemed to actually get worse. And the, the, the perfused vessel density actually got better. Uh, and so, I think mostly what this taught us is that there is more information to be had. And as we're trying to make decisions about our fluid therapy, uh, it may be useful to look at, at this at microscan. Uh, and so what we're currently looking at is similar measurements and looking before and after a bolus of a, of a synthetic hydroxyethyl starch um, called vet starch, uh, which is a, a commonly used IV fluid uh, that, we, that we use under anesthesia. Uh, and so this has funding from the Morris Animal Foundation, and we hope that if we're getting good data, there are some other centers that have microscan instruments as well, and we may be able to add to the number of horses that, uh, you know, that we're able to evaluate. Uh, so second problem that, uh, that I wanted to, to go into clinical trial related is antibiotic resistance and surgical site infection. Um, I, I think probably you all are, are aware that the development of antimicrobial resistance is, is an issue of global concern. I, we, we absolutely run into this issue with, with our own veterinary patients uh, where we have multi-drug resistant uh, you know, bacterial infections. And we're also aware as veterinarians that we may be contributing to, contributing to this problem and we would like to not, uh, to not do that. And so trying to use antimicrobials responsibly is, is something that we're, that we're all doing, but occasionally struggling to do because we don't have enough information about, you know, about how to do this properly. Also, somewhat specific for the horse, uh, horses are at risk of antibiotic-induced colitis. Uh, this happens in humans as well, and while it's relatively rare in the horse, it, it certainly can be fatal, uh, and it's been shown that it, an average of four days of antibiotics uh, was, was needed for horses. You know, the horses that developed antibiotic-induced colitis, they were usually on for an average of about four days. And the other reason for thinking about could we shorten our courses of antimicrobials is that they cost a lot. Uh, depending on what we're using, it can be upwards of $200 per day to have a horse on IV antibiotics. Uh, and so for owners that are, that are paying out of pocket for you know, perioperative treatment or post-op antimicrobials, this, this really can have an effect on the total bill and, and can affect the number of horses that we're able to, to treat. So in the realm of what do we already know, um, we know that clinical practice ranges widely and is, uh, and is largely personal preference. So clinical practice for colic patients ranges from no antibiotics at all to a five-day regimen. And I, I certainly have talked to people who, who say that they put horses on for a week or more on, on antimicrobials. And there's already, there are already some studies out there um, looking at different regimens for antimicrobials after colic surgery. Um, so somewhere horses were given antibiotics. This was retrospectively looking at less than 36 versus more than 36 hours. Another one looking at 120 hours post-op versus 72 hours post-op. Uh, and in both of those, no difference in surgical site infection. Uh, we also have some information from elective arthroscopy in horses where there was a fairly low for it, at least you know, with with what's been reported in horses, fairly low infection rate, um, both with and without antibiotics. So antibiotics did not seem to, to further lower that infection rate. On the human side of things, uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis for clean, clean contaminated and contaminated procedures. So you know, kind of across the spectrum, 
anything other than, than infection, um, the human guidelines are for less than 24 hours of the total of antimicrobials. Um, the, and, and through a you know, number of different studies, uh, the benefit of prophylactic antibiotics is there, but has not been shown if you increase those, that antimicrobial uh, regime beyond 24 hours. Uh, and in one study, in fact, increasing it beyond 24 hours actually increased the risk of surgical site infection. And so we hypothesize that horses receiving 24 hours of perioperative antimicrobials would not have a significantly different rate of surgical site infection, fever, or low white blood cell count compared to those getting them for 72 hours. Uh, and we're looking at various biomarkers uh, as well as some typical things like complete blood count postoperatively and, and then tracking surgical site infection and, and fever. Uh, and we're doing this in collaboration with North Carolina State University. Uh, one of our emergency protocol care fellows is, is on, on faculty there now, and so collaborating with them with funding from the Morris Animal Foundation. And so we've been you know, enrolling any horse greater than one year of age who, who presents for, uh, for emergency colic surgery, and it's a, a placebo-controlled double-blinded study uh, aiming for 48 total cases, which um, you know, when, when we're talking about human clinical trials, this is tiny and uh, perhaps will be difficult to, you know, we, based on our estimates of surgical site infection, we should be powered to see a difference here, but this is certainly one of the challenges that we, that we find on, that we face in veterinary medicine is just sheer numbers and trying to get good information on, on clinical trials. Uh, the last problem that I wanted to, you know, to talk about is postoperative ileus. Um, so what is postop ileus? It's essentially slow intestinal motility after surgery. In human patients, interestingly, this, this is absolutely a problem in humans, and it's often more related to colon surgery. In our horses, it usually is after small intestinal surgery, uh, but the, you know, the problems are similar. It, it, if it's, this is largely due to you know, inflammation in the gut. There may be some you know, neural reflex effects that are going on. Uh, there, this can be related to actual problems with an anastomosis if you resect a portion of bowel and, and anastomose it together. Uh, but what this results in after surgery when the small intestine isn't moving properly is that fluid backs up onto the stomach. Uh, horses can't vomit, uh, which makes my job perhaps a little bit less messy, uh, but it does mean that we have to pass a tube up the horse's nose and into the stomach. And what they're doing here is what, what we call refluxing the horse. So we start off a siphon and then we siphon kind of like siphon, siphoning off your fish tank. We siphon all this extra fluid into our buckets. Uh, and horses that are producing a lot of reflux can produce 50, 60, even more liters of fluid per day with this reflux. And we need IV fluids to re replace these fluid losses. So not only is this somewhat uncomfortable for the horse, uh, but it's hugely expensive for the owner. If, if this horse, it, it's pretty labor intensive to be refluxing this fluid off of the horse every two hours and, and replacing this with IV fluids. Uh, and additionally, when the gut isn't moving, it also sets them up to potentially absorb uh, bacterial toxins from this inflamed gut that's not moving very well and intestine after surgery that's just sitting there and not moving also tends to be more prone to adhesion. Um, so this is probably one of our, our biggest challenges after small intestinal resection is, is post-op ileus. So in terms of you know, what do we already know, the, the incidence has, has been reported as you know, up to 30% after small intestinal resection and anastomosis, um, more like 15% if no resection is needed. Uh, risk factors are small intestinal resection, and then we also, as well as the length of intestine, and we also know that uh, independent of the type of lesion, a horse that comes in you know, sicker or more compromised, so increased heart rate, increased pack cell volume, uh, that seems to put a horse at risk of postoperative ileus. Uh, and then we think this is multifactorial, so inflammation, increased sympathetic tone, um, bowel edema, and then anastomotic and, and mechanical factors. There are a number of, of approaches that have been used in human medicine uh, that 
that we use to some degree. So early enteral nutrition uh, on, on the small and large animal side, we don't, we can't feed them a lot of food initially, but small, small frequent meals and trying to feed the gut as early as possible um, seems to be helpful no matter what species we're talking about. Uh, on the human side, some, some physicians will use will use gum chewing. So if, if they can't, if your patient can't tolerate uh, you know, food intake, the act of chewing gum, kind of tasting something can be useful. Uh, and there, there is a group, I'm not involved in this study, but there is a group that is using a flavored bit that goes in their mouth. So the horses you know, taste something sweet and, and you know, kind of lick it and, and chew on it, which would, which would be analogous to the gum chewing. Uh, early ambulation can be, it has been shown to be a, a benefit in human patients, and we use that as well in our, in our horses, getting them you know, for short walks and getting up, up and about. Uh, and then managing pain so that they don't have really high sympathetic tones so that uh, you know, the pain doesn't itself perpetuate the ileus. Uh, but one of the challenges is that opioids are useful for pain in, in people and uh, and in our veterinary patients, but not at all good for gut motility. And so trying to manage their pain without opioids. Another strategy that's been used in human patients is acupuncture to prevent post-op ileus. There's not a, a ton of information on this, but uh, there's, there's you know, actually more, more information in rodent models, uh, but but some in actual humans, and so looking at you know this this meta analysis looked at open abdomen and laparoscopic procedures, and you're know, looking at, uh, at at analgesic consumption, and you know, they did not find a dramatic difference in analgesic consumption, but did find that they're a little bit faster for the patients being treated with acupuncture to defecate, um, faster return of of gastrointestinal sounds and a decreased length of hospital stay. Um, and you know, all that equates, especially the decreased hospital stay on the human side also equates to money. Uh, you know, getting, getting people out faster will cost less. Uh, possible mechanisms of acupuncture, you know, there, it may be that there's some activation of the vagus nerve, there may be an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, and, and there may be some benefit to regulating gastrointestinal hormones. Um, and a lot of the proposed mechanisms are, are based on rodent models of disease. So in equine medicine, uh, and this is a, a horse that had, had some facial trauma, so not one of our study horses, um, but you know, receiving electroacupuncture to try to stimulate return of, of nerve function. Uh, so horse owners are, most of them are actually quite familiar with acupuncture. There's a lot of musculoskeletal applications and uh, it, you know, there's some evidence that it's effective for chronic thoracolumbar pain. Um, certainly gets used for other types of musculoskeletal pain. Um, and there's, there's some evidence in experimental models that acupuncture may help with, with pain in gastrointestinal system so it can increase the pain threshold in experimental models. And so we have actually found that so we, we got involved in a clinical trial with using acupuncture to prevent post-op ileus in horses with small intestinal strangulations. And this is a, a multi-center clinical trial with Washington State University and Michigan State University sponsored by the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Foundation. Uh, and you know, we have found that while trying to en enroll patients, uh, the, the antibiotic study is a little bit of a tougher sell to clients um, because they're skeptical about, well, shouldn't, isn't more better? And, um, and you know, some, some clients are, are a little bit more willing to enroll their horses in that than others. Uh, most clients are actually pretty positive about acupuncture. And the only issue I've had with enrolling cases in this clinical trial has been clients who don't want to be in the placebo end of the end of the trial. Um, even though we have, you know, I, I, we've never done acupuncture before for any of these cases. And uh, this is not, uh, it would not be considered standard of care at, at this, at this time at all. Uh, but we've, you know, so we're, we're enrolling cases in this, in this trial, and they're either getting acupuncture or placebo, which in, involves our acupuncture clinicians standing in a stall with them uh, for the amount of time that it would take to do acupuncture. And 
then we're, we're monitoring their clinical signs, uh, their vital parameters, as well as doing daily ultrasound, which is one of the best measures of what is actually happening with motility in the small intestine. We can visualize the intestine well on ultrasound and, and actually see, uh, see whether it's contracting as it should be. Uh, so just wanted to you know, kind of wrap up here with a little bit of a plug for our, our clinical trials office. So of, of the resources that we have, this has been really useful. I, it's say, you know, Danny had, had asked me to speak on the, and I'm from the equine vet med side of things and not, you know, not what I would consider, a, you know, one of them, certainly not a research intensive clinician. On the small animal side, there are you know, lots of clinical trials ongoing and you know, pretty much all the time looking at cancer in our small animal patients. And this is really where our clinical trials office is, is doing the bulk of their work. But that's quite useful to us as well, uh, you know, doing these smaller clinical trials on things like equine colic, particularly when it comes to coordinating uh, you know, multi-center grant submissions and you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, how to compile and, and structure some of these studies and, and, you know, and the funding that comes with them. And so that's been, you know, that's been really useful to us. On the, you know, on the library side of, of things, uh, you know, I mentioned before, I've, I've got students with me uh, all the time. So even though I'm not in a, in a lecture hall uh, you know, teaching all that often, I have fourth year students by my side pretty much all the time. I've got residents with me all the time. And you know, our, I, I honestly can't imagine, you know, we, are, we are so spoiled and we take it for granted that we have access to pretty much any textbook we would possibly ever need. Uh, we, you know, I, I, it's hard to even remember the days of having to go to the library to look up the articles that you wanted and the limitations there. And sometimes, quite frankly, it's overwhelming what's, uh, what's open to you. And I find that when I'm you know, researching a clinical case or a book chapter that uh, sometimes for hours I will go down some rabbit hole um, because we have access to anything that we would want to put, pull up in PDF form and uh, and then suddenly find that I've, I, you know, I wouldn't say wasted my time, but I've <laughs> gotten off track from where I was supposed to go with whatever research I was doing. Uh, and I think you know, training our students to really use these resources uh, and practice evidence-based medicine is, is important, um, but also a limitation, I think, once our students get out into practice and they're not part of a university system, uh, they're, you know, they, they lean on us in academia to be able to find some of, of this, uh, you know, find some of these articles for them or, you know, give them some guidance through textbook chapters or, uh, you know, help provide them with the best evidence-based medicine because they, they don't always have access to, to all of these resources. Uh, you know, well, well, I was talking more on the clinical trial side of things, you know, probably what we're, you know, what I'm daily doing, you know, through online textbooks, PubMed, Cab Abstracts is, Looking for potential solutions to difficult clinical cases. Uh, I've, you know, I've got two right now uh, that you know they aren't my only difficult clinical cases, but I've got a horse with an with an oral sinus fistula and another one with um, with some some urethral sinus bleeding. Uh, and these are these are odd cases, and there's not a lot that that's been written about these and, uh, you know, and can be challenging cases. And so looking to find even you know, case reports about what has someone else done and, and you know, how could we do things differently or what else could we try to, you know, to, resolve, these, to resolve these cases. Uh, and that's, you know, I'd say that's probably what I'm doing the most um, you know, day to day. To day. Uh, and then you know, certainly as we're working on grant proposals and manuscripts and book chapters and Taking our master's degree you know, students through their you know, through their let searches for their for their thesis, uh, yeah, we certainly appreciate the the resources that are in front of us, and I suspect um, underutilize some of the actual uh, you know, help from the librarians that we you know, that that we have access to, but we're often online in the middle of the night trying to do it ourselves. So. I figured I should at least put a reference slide in if I was uh, speaking to librarians, uh, but I 
we'll leave you with a slide of uh, this is this is why I do what I do and how I got into it. Uh, that you know, horses are pretty amazing athletes, partners, and buddies. Um, and this is this is my girl Serafina, uh, looking all, all all fuzzy and scraggly in her in her winter coat. <laughs> And I would be happy to take any any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mudd. That was that was wonderful. And yes, you do have a few questions. So um, I'm going to try to run through these here, and I'll kind of review. Um, so um, um, Rebecca was asking, um, do you do imaging like ultrasound? How do you tell if it's strangulation versus more of a mild twisting? Yeah, ultrasound is ultrasound's really helpful for small intestinal lesions. And then um, the rectal exam is the other mainstay of, so that's not imaging, but that is direct feeling. Uh, and one of the challenges that we have in horses, in, in particularly adult horses, is they're huge. The ultrasound only sees so far about 30 centimeters depth. And so we can't see into the whole horse. Uh, and because horses are hindgut fermenters and they're always producing gas in their colon, their colon takes up a huge amount of the abdomen. Ultrasound doesn't see through gas. Uh, it gets re reflected back. Uh, and so that, that can make it challenging to see everything that we need to see on ultrasound. We can x-ray abdomens as well. Uh, in the adult horse, that's not a practical thing to do in the field, but we've got overhead x-ray units that we, so we can image the abdomen, the level of decay detail compared to humans and small animals is, is pretty poor. Um, and so ultrasound is a mainstay for us in, in our colic workup uh, as well as, as rectal exam. Interesting. Um, Danny was asking if there are certain breeds of horses that are more prone to some of these issues you're seeing. Yeah, that's a, a, a good question, and I'd say it it depends a little bit on which type of colic. And there are certain things. So, for instance, um, enteroliths or intestinal stones are more common in certain geographic areas. So, particularly uh, you know California in the Southwest, uh, and then um, within that geographic area, miniature horses and Arabian horses seem to be more predisposed to getting enteroliths or intestinal stones. Uh, and you know, for things like large colon volvulus, uh, you know, the, a, a twist or strangulation of the large intestine. Um, thoroughbred brood mares um, are, so horses after they have a foal uh, seem to be more, more at risk of twisting their colon. Interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing the information about the acupuncture and other things. Um, so your favorite librarian, Jessica Page, was asking, um, what other sort of medical treatments um, might you, you know, kind of get into if it, for a case that doesn't warrant surgery? So other options? Yeah, and I, I focused on surgery, so that's where our clinical trials are, and that's what I enjoy doing. Although I will say that I, there is, there is always a, a great success in feeling like we got a horse through medically and got them out the door within a few days. Uh, yeah, that, that's better for owner and, and, and horse by far. So generally what that involves is withholding food for usually not a long period of time, but about a day, uh, at least not adding if there's an impaction colic, we're trying to not add to that. Uh, we, we give them fluids of some sort. So that may be through a nasogastric tube. So uh, you're putting additional fluids in, sometimes laxatives, which are, are usually your various electrolytes or maybe salts within, the, within those fluids, and then IV fluids, particularly if they can't intake a lot uh, orally, and pain management. Uh, and so a lot of these, most of the medical colics are manageable in the field, um, but the advantages that we have in the hospital are that we've got 24-7 nursing staff. And so if, if we can make small changes you know, hour by hour, minute by minute, if we need to, um, and you really manage these horses more intensively. And most of that is you know, fluid therapy and pain management are, are the biggies. So you're kind of mentioning some of the good hospital care. So Allison was asking, um, does OSU provide vet services to any horse or to those who primarily need surgical care? She says, uh, you know, it seems unlikely that other vets in the state are providing the same level of care given your sophisticated equipment and high qualified personnel. So 
I think a little more on that would be interesting. Yeah, and we we provide services. So I, I split my time between the after hours emergency service and the daytime soft tissue surgery service. And so we see horses that are referred by veterinarians for specific therapies, but we also see you know, self referrals by you know, from or owner referral, I suppose. Uh, for for a variety of conditions, and we have you know, the services that we have are internal medicine, surgery, uh, emergency and critical care, as well as uh, you know, lameness evaluation, and we also provide field service. I'm not part of the field service, but we we have ambulatory clinicians that will go out in the field to see your horse if you, you know, live within a 30 mile radius of Columbus, and so. All variety of conditions and it doesn't are even though I'm on the surgery service I'm seeing a lot of cases that don't actually end up needing surgery that, that we're able to treat medically. My goodness. Um, okay let's see so um, Joshua was asking some questions about your studies um, so if they don't want to be in the control group are the groups not blinded was one of the questions about blinding groups and then how do you control for um, things like biases, things like that. So, your horses. Yeah. So the the yeah, and I, I did say that they we run into a challenge with owners, you know, not wanting to be in the control group, and so I yeah, I should have clarified that they're not in the study. There is no yeah that that we you know this this is blinded and 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 randomized, and so yeah, they don't get to choose, and so if they say hey, we don't. We, we want acupuncture, we don't want to be in the control group. I think we've only had one or two that I, that they really, really, really wanted acupuncture. And I said that this isn't typically something that we would offer, but we you know, agreed to do it, but they were not in the, not in the study at that point. Interesting. Um, all right, so a little uh, question here about some of the literature. How do you advise students to approach the biomedical research when much of the research might be focused on different species? It's so, interesting. Yeah, and it depends what the it depends what the issue is, and so usually we've got enough handle on on that. So if, for instance, a student was wanting to you know to research, say we were doing you know arthroscopic surgery for you know for a for joint condition in a horse. There's some things that are that are very common that there's a good amount of information on. And for some of those procedures, or you know, at least the how-to on the procedure, there's very good textbook information on those. And so for vet students, often that's where I'll start them. Uh, and, and we actually we we have links through the library to, to some of the textbook chapters that would be most useful. And we have those on our Carbon Canvas site for, for our students that are on our rotation so that we, we try to make it easy and give them that direction right off the bat uh, versus, you know, a horse with, a, with an oral nasal fistula, the student that was, you know, that is currently taking care of that case with me, I said, you know, see what, see what you can find on this, uh, you know, on this case and, you know, go ahead and, and do a little research on this. And, and she, and she was, you know, I think our students are pretty savvy uh, in, picking up on, on a lot of this information, especially researching clinical cases, they, you, they get familiar enough with a lot of the journals that we use and are pretty good. Sometimes they need some prompting on terminology to use. If, if there's a term that we use in equine medicine that maybe is not the same exact term that you would use in human medicine, that, that's, that's one thing that I, I think sometimes they need advice on if, if they can't find anything on it, then I'll, I'll give them some pointers for just altering the, the terminology that they're going to use. Uh, but, you know, for instance, a student was able to, to come up with some pertinent veterinary articles and case studies in horses, but then also had gone a little bit into the human literature and, you know, and, and found that fairly readily. Um, so um, Kent gave a shout out to um, your colleagues at Kansas State that has a great veterinary program and then said, uh, thank you for your compassionate work with other species who share our world. I think many of us are, are feeling that way to thank you for that. Um, 
Jeffrey asked, have there been any new developments, um, correlations or discoveries with effect of horse diet to these illnesses? Understanding such parallels are expanding in human medicine and illness. So what about the horse's diet? Yeah, there's, there's probably two arms to this. The first one that we've known about forever is that absolutely the diet and changes in diet will the you know, changes in diet. That is a risk factor for colic. Uh, and so you have a horse has been on a steady diet of a certain kind of hay and a certain kind of grain and suddenly you change it to totally different types. Uh, that is a recipe for you know, intestinal disturbance and distress. Uh, and you know, particularly high grain, high carbohydrate diets, uh, you know, horses are meant to be on you know, a lot of forage and, and fiber. And so if they have a lot of what's called non-structural carbohydrate, this, this can put them at risk of of colic um, and you know, and potentially some other diseases too, like like laminitis. Um, the other arm of this is you know, if we sort of go down the path of the microbiome and you know what what microbes are supposed to be there and what are they doing and how does this relate to disease? And I would say that uh, you know, similar to uh, to what we see in on the human side of things, this is a huge area of, of research. Now that it's possible to, you know, relatively quickly analyze microbiome on, you know, on a large scale, uh, there's there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of researchers that are looking into how does this interplay you know, with colic specifically. Uh, you know, there's a, a study that Dr. Sue Holcomb and her colleagues did at uh, Michigan State University and collaborating with some other institutions that were looking at these post foaling broodmares, so the horses that, that have their foals and then twist their colons and looking at, are there certain changes in the microbiome that might put them at risk or might help predict uh, you know, this, this occurrence? And it, it's of course not as straightforward as we would like it to be, but, it, but yes, it does look like there's some interplay and that certainly is an area of, of interest. Interesting. Um, you have, um, well, probably this maybe can be uh, one of the last questions here for you. I think we're getting closer to 4.30. Um, Edward asks, do antibiotics hurt the microbiomes in horse intestines or stomachs? Uh, yes, and frighteningly oh, so. Uh, yeah, it's, you almost don't even want to know what's, what's happening. Uh, there is a, a researcher at Texas A&M who'd presented at the Colic Symposium, which is an every three year conference that we, you know, that, that we have, and talked about, I think it was metronidazole that they had used on, on horses that had, I think, cannulation of their right dorsal colon. And I, I may be, uh, I'm now sorry that this is recorded because I'm probably paraphrasing this study uh, terribly, but uh, mostly what I remember is that She'd given this antibiotic that we've all given to lots of horses, and it's not a first-line drug, but it, it's and it's quite good against anaerobes, and so good for you know certain types of infection, and it, it just decimated you know their their microbiome, uh, and some of them got actually quite sick from from the antibiotics, uh, and so yeah, when we talk about being responsible with antibiotics in horses, it's not just for the greater good and and preventing antimicrobial resistance, it's also because it, it can hurt them. And I'm, you know, I think it probably you know, can certainly do that to people as well, but you know, that amount of disruption where you or I might just feel nauseous for a few days and in horses, it can give them fatal colitis, uh, you know, diarrhea that, that can actually end up being fatal. And so that there is a, a kind of delicate balance. And, you know, and for that reason, not necessarily with colic, but with other types of infections. So orthopedic infections like bone or joint infections, some certain types of sinus infections. Uh, we, we use a lot of regional antibiotics. Um, so things that are called regional limb perfusions where we're just delivering the antibiotic through a regional vein that goes to the area of infection. So we can use lower amounts of antibiotics and use ones that maybe are not cost-effective to use on the whole horse um, or using things like antibiotic impregnated beads, uh, you know, dissolvable beads uh, that can go into certain areas of infection and deliver that antibiotic without affecting the, the entire horse quite so much. Like a targeted sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. 
I'm sure that we could go on and on with all of our questions. And thank you for making all of this really uh, be able to relate to those of us who who work with human care too. So thank you so much for that. But that was, this was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the good work you're doing for all of our animals. Um, thank you. I think that will wrap up our, our Q and A. And uh, we really appreciate you taking time to meet with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you very much.